The following message was recorded at Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. More information can be found online at Bethlehem.Church. Good morning to those of you online, the rest of you here. Glad you're with us this morning. In our American culture, Labor Day marks the pivot point from summer to fall. Technically, September 22nd, 10 days from now, is the official first day of fall. But psychologically and emotionally, most of us have already made the pivot. The weather's changing, school is beginning, football is starting. Some of us may tune in for the Vikings game this afternoon. Culturally, we've crossed the boundary marker from summer to fall, no matter what a calendar might might tell us. And as a church, we are part of this cultural calendar. Group Connect, like Kenny said, begins today for those who are looking for a small group. Kids Sunday School is beginning afresh this fall. Youth Ministry, Adult Sunday School Classes, Women's Bible Study, Moms, All Nations Fellowship, Hispanic Ministries, more. We are launching ministry afresh. It's fall. But fall launch downtown this year is different than years in the recent past because of a difficult summer that we've been through together. We've experienced a lot of change over the last four months. It's probably been painful for many of us. On the one hand, I don't think we're done processing what we've experienced. One doesn't just quickly move on after significant change. On the other hand, we are also are not called to dwell on the past but to seek the Lord on how he would cause us to restore and rebuild together. I don't know exactly what that will look like to process where we've been, to learn, to seek the Lord on what's next and how we move forward. But I believe we'll be helped if we take cues from the church in Antioch here in this text. They sought the Lord as they faced a pivot point of its own. And there are important lessons for us in this. It's good of the Lord to have us in Acts 13 in our sermon schedule this morning. In this message, I'll focus on verses 1 through 3. Verses 1 through 3. And here, we see that the church at Antioch, and at, at least these five leaders and perhaps the whole church, in some form or fashion, they're engaged in certain practices that were means of grace for God to do a work in their midst. They heard from the Lord in the taught and the prophetic word. They worshiped, they fasted, and they prayed. God gives individual Christians in the corporate church practices through which he ordains that we would commune with him and that he would work in us and through us to the world. The church in Antioch needed God. We need God. We want God to work in our midst as we step into a new season of ministry here this fall. We need these practices too. Are we walking in them? My hope is that we would. And the aim of this message is that it would help us do that. So as we focus on verses 1 through 3 this morning, we'll look at three things. What are these practices that we see here? One. Two. Why do we need spiritual practices? And three. How will we walk in them? What? Why? And how? Let me pray before we go further. Let's pray. God, you are our greatest joy Deep down, we have this craving that nothing in this world can satisfy, that only you can satisfy. We turn to you. You are our greatest joy and you are our greatest need. We're weak. We're frail. You are the strong one. We need help. Father, we do not want to grieve the Spirit this morning. We don't want to resist the Spirit this morning. 
we want to walk in step with the Spirit this morning. Where we come and may have hard, hard places in our hearts, soften them. Where we may be blind, give us sight. Where we can't hear, give us ears to hear. And change us, draw us near. In Jesus' name, amen. Point one, what are these practices? Let's go back to verse one. Let's read that. Now there were in the church in Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Luke doesn't make clear who the prophets are and who the teachers are. Here some commentators say there's a stark dividing line between them. Some are prophets, some are teachers. Other commentators say there's not a sharp dividing line and these five men are both teachers and prophets, maybe stronger, more in one gift than the other. But regardless, the church was receiving the taught word and the prophetic word as a regular course. It was one of their spiritual practices. What distinguishes these two? Taught word, prophetic word. The taught word is preaching, instruction from the scriptures, teaching doctrine, passing on to others the received apostolic teaching. The prophetic word, which maybe I'm more, less familiar with, is a spontaneous revelation. Or the way Sam Storms put it, the human report of a divine revelation. Sometimes prophetic word is an insight on future events. Like a few chapters earlier in our book of Acts, Agabus foretold a famine in Acts 11, 27 through 28. Sometimes they're predictive. Sometimes they are directive. Like here in chapter 13, it says, the Spirit says, set apart Saul and Barnabas for the work. The prophetic word is directive. Sometimes, and some would say more often than guidance and direction, and prediction. These prophetic words are for people's upbuilding and encouragement and consolation in the gospel, in the truth, in the taught word, which is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 3. In Acts 2, we are told that the prophetic gift is given to a variety of people, men and women, young and old, across, across the classes here. How are we to respond to a prophetic word? 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 through 21 tells us. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 through 21 says, Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. First, we are not to respond to prophecies by despising them. We're actually told by Paul in 1 Corinthians 14, 1 to eagerly desire the prophetic gift. It's a good thing. Just like when we entertain a stranger, we may actually be entertaining an angel according to Hebrews 13, 2. When someone utters a prophetic word, we may be entertaining a word from the Spirit as well. To receive a prophetic word and dismiss it out of hand to not even prayerfully consider it within the community, you may be quenching the Spirit. So prophetic words are not despised. Prophetic words are welcome. And in the welcoming, they are tested. The First Thessalonians 5.19 passage. There are false prophets. We meet one in Acts 13, verse 6. That was just read. Bar-Jesus called a magician a Jewish false prophet. What do we test the prophetic word with? What is the measuring stick for this? In Matthew told, Matthew, Matthew 17, excuse me, we are told of an amazing account of Jesus being on a high mountain with Peter, James, and John. And while alone together on this high mountain, Jesus is transfigured. The hidden brilliance of his glory was revealed as his face shone bright like the sun and his clothes became white as light. And then a bright cloud overshadowed 
them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. The bright shining face, the white shining clothes, the voice from the bright cloud on the mountain, that is an encounter with the presence of God. Visibly seeing the glory of God the Son and audibly hearing the voice of God the Father, that is receiving a word. That is receiving a revelation. The Lord met with them in such a tangible and powerful way that they fell on their faces and were terrified. They experienced the high, exalted, and majestic otherness of God in an utterly astounding way. And by the way, there's no mountain peak we can climb. There's no exotic vacation we can undertake that would compare even an ounce worth toward the glory those three men experienced at that moment. And that's a commercial for coming attractions for the Christian. That is an experience that's awaiting us in the new heavens and new earth every day, all day, when our faith will be sight. We are always going to be full and satisfied by the awe-inspiring, luminescent glory of God. In part, now, more fully, then. Even though Peter had an otherworldly experience of literally hearing the voice of God on the mountaintop, he writes this about that experience. Go to 2 Peter 1, 17 through 20. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 17 through 20. And this ties into the prophetic word. Peter says this, For when he, Jesus, received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Scripture is the prophetic word more fully confirmed that Peter is talking about in that passage. Scripture is the prophetic word more fully confirmed by which we test all other prophetic word. Test the spirits with Scripture. And hold fast what is good. God speaks in many ways. He speaks in dreams like he did with Joseph around the birth of Jesus. He speaks in visions like he did with Cornelius in chapter 10 of Acts. He speaks directly in his own voice as Peter, James, and John heard on the mountain of the transfiguration in Matthew 17. He speaks through creation, Romans 1. He speaks in a uniquely authoritative way through Scripture. And he speaks most authoritatively and clearly through his Son, through Jesus. Hebrews 1. So long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. All the Bible points to Jesus, according to John 5, 39 through 40. All prophetic utterances should point to Jesus, according to 1 John 4, 2 through 3. The teaching gift and the prophetic gift belong together. The more sure word in Scripture centered on Jesus is used to test the prophetic word. Both the taught word and the prophetic word need to be delivered with maturity and care, received with maturity and care, and tested with maturity and care. Both need testing. The taught word needs to be tested as well as the prophetic word. They're not just false prophets. They're also false teachers. Like the Bereans in Acts 17, a few chapters later on, we should examine the scriptures ourselves to test all being taught from this pulpit. Everything being taught in all those classrooms. Everything being taught 
in a small group, as well as prophetic words. Let's return to Acts 13. Verses 2 and 3 launch us into a significant period of gospel advance in the book of Acts, which hereafter follows the missionary journeys of Paul and his co-workers. Let's read those two verses. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. As these leaders and potentially the rest of the church worshiped and fasted, the Holy Spirit gave a directive. Possibly or probably through a prophetic utterance, That was tested and confirmed by the other leaders and perhaps the broader community. And once it was clear they they were to send Paul and Barnabas into a new work, the church prayed and fasted to send them into that work, presumably asking for guidance and for protection and for fruitfulness in that work. So through worship and fasting and through prayer, and fasting, the Spirit worked. The Spirit chose to work. So get these three practices. What is worship? Briefly, one of our elders, Brian Tab, has written on this passage. And he explains worship well when he says, Worshiping the Lord serves as a summary reference to the believer's devotion to, delight in, and dependence on the Lord as expressed in corporate petition, thanksgiving, and praise. Devotion to, delight in, and dependence on God expressed through petition, thanksgiving, and praise. And here we are this morning doing just that. What is prayer? Prayer is talking to God, asking Him for help. Listening to him, communing with the one that loves us and who we in turn love. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, God does not only give us his word, he also gives us his ear. He wants us to come to him. Third, what is fasting? This is something that I say sadly has not been a regular practice in my Christian life. It may be true for some of us here. Uh, Maybe often neglected, not understood. We'll give more attention to fasting this morning. And what I say here will be a very brief introduction. And I want to commend to you David Mathis' book, uh, Habits of Grace. And he has a chapter on fasting. It's It's a short chapter. And it gives good biblical underpinning and good practicals on how to get started in this practice. It's a helpful guide. The New Testament doesn't include an an explicit command for Christians to fast, but Jesus assumes we will do it when he gives instruction on how to do it, or to say more accurately, how not to do it in Matthew 6, 16 through 18. He says, when you fast, assuming you will, assuming we will, when you fast, Don't look gloomy. Don't disfigure your face to make it obvious you're fasting or make it seem like you're doing, uh, you're subjecting yourself to some heroic hardship. That's not how you're supposed to fast. What is fasting? How do we walk in it? Let's look briefly at what fasting is and what fasting is not. First, what fasting is not. Fasting is not a badge of honor. If you are fasting or doing any other spiritual practice so that you would be seen by others and presumably praised by others, it's an empty activity. The purpose of fasting is to more clearly see and experience God and receive his help. If you are doing it to be seen other than to see, it's a total reversal of the purpose of fasting. And you don't need to do it to be seen. Because you're already seen. Your Father who sees in secret rewards this hidden act of devotion according to Jesus in Matthew 6. You've already seen. There's also not an expression of devaluing the body 
or the need for food or the rightful place for enjoying food, like those pastries we talked about earlier. The Bible records instances of fasting and feasting. Jesus fasted 40 days in the desert before beginning his public ministry. And he ate meals with his disciples and tax collectors and sinners. He was accused by the Pharisees, presumably, of being a drunkard and glutton because he came as one eating and drinking. Second, what fasting is, is a form of self-humbling and of a uniquely focusing ourselves Godward. It's often coupled with prayer. It can be done personally or communally as it was by at least these five leaders at Antioch. Typically, Christian fasting means going without food, not water, for a period of time with a spiritual purpose in view. You can fast from other good things besides food and drink. Uh, Going without anything that is legitimate in and of itself can be a fast, like social media or sports. But what makes a fast a Christian fast is that it's done for Christian purposes. And what are those purposes that make a fast a Christian fast? Again, the Habits of Grace, David Mathis includes a list from Donald Whitney Now, some of the purposes for fasting that we find in Scripture, as I list them, consider how these might be helpful for you or how our church might be needing this right now. Purposes for fasting. Fasting strengthens our prayer. It gives focus and an intensity to it. That's seeking God's guidance. That seems to be a view in this passage in Acts 13. Guidance happened at least. Expressing grief. Maybe I've experienced grief and loss this summer. Seeking deliverance or protection. Expressing repentance and returning to God. Humbling oneself before God. Expressing concern for the work of God, including ministering to the needs of others. Praying and fasting for work to be done. Overcoming temptation and dedicating yourself to God. Expressing love and worship to God. In fasting, we have a a felt experience and a cultivation of the fact that we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It shows that Jesus, the bread of life, is enough. Physical hunger pangs remind us that there is a deeper hunger, a deeper longer, a longing still that only Jesus satisfies. Fasting draws us to him. It is a worthy and important practice to take up. Here we move from the practices to point two. Why do we need them? Why do we need spiritual practices in the Christian life? I'm 45 years old. I don't know if I look old or young for my age. You can tell me sometime. I have a lot of gray and not a lot of it left. Halfway to 90. Halfway to 90. But in my family, there is a really bad uh, history of heart health. And because of that, I try to exercise about five days a week. And a few weeks ago, I had a little go-kart accident where I got T-boned by a go-kart. And I got the wind knocked out of me. I couldn't breathe for a few seconds. It was really alarming. My side went numb. I had to stop, obviously. I got out of that go-kart. I limped off the track. My ribs were sore, my back, my hip, a hurting unit. So it's going to be probably, it's been two weeks since I've exercised. It's probably going to be a few weeks more. And in this time off, I know that my stamina and my muscles have gotten weaker. And as it goes for the outer man, so it goes for the inner man. 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8 says, Train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Just like there are exercises that are proven to strengthen the body, 
There are practices that God has given us that he said he would use to strengthen our spiritual faculties. And it was communion with him. God can work any way he chooses. He can choose to get our attention through a burning bush that is not consumed like Moses or through being swallowed up by a big fish like Jonah. Bushes and big fish are possible ways that he works, but receiving the taught and prophetic word, worshiping, praying, and fasting are some of the promised ways that he works. It's possible that God can appear to us in a burning bush. It would be foolish to sit in front of a bush in our yard waiting for fire to come for God to manifest his presence and direct us. He has the authority to do that, the ability to do that, and he just might choose to do that, but he hasn't indicated that he would work in this way as a pattern for how he operates. But in these practices, he has said that. It would be foolish of us to sit in front of a bush in our front yard waiting for presence and direction. And it would be foolish of us not to engage in the word, worship, prayer, fasting, when God has told us to do these things and he would work in us and through us in these ways. This is not magic. It's not a silver bullet for divine action. God will not be forced into a formula that makes him respond in a certain way like a puppet on our string. He's not like a machine. We just push the right buttons to get the outcome that we're wanting or looking for. He is sovereign, not us. He is the one who does what he pleases and it pleases him to often use means he has prescribed to do his work. It's like putting the sail up. Putting the sail up so when the wind blows, it will carry us along. We don't control the wind, but we know that the wind uses sails to get the boat across the lake. Spiritual act activities are like putting up the sail through which the Spirit will move us along when the Spirit decides to move, like when this wind decides to blow. From the wide practices to how, point three, how will we walk in these practices? What is our fuel? To me, one of the pointed moments in Kenny's sermon last week was his clear and strong call at the end to humility and prayer. Humility and prayer. I draw attention to this here because I think humility and prayer go together. And they relate to each other. Humility and prayer and humility in any spiritual practice are related. Humility is the precondition for walking in any of these practices. Or put a different way, pride ruins these practices that God's given us. Pride is rooted in self-absorption, an inordinate uh, self-concern. We've been sucked up into pride when we find that we are seeking to prove ourselves to others, show others that we are somebody, to make a name for ourselves through our accomplishments. We can take spiritual practices that God has given us to commune with him and to receive help from him and use them instead for a self-salvation project, turning them into a list of accomplishments to prove that we deserve God's favor or to prove that we're better than someone. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity said that pride is by nature competitive. It involves others. He says this. He says, Pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next person. We say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good-looking, but they are not. They are proud of being richer or cleverer or better looking than others. If everyone else became equally rich or clever or good looking, there would be nothing to be proud about. When pride is in control of our heart, we are constantly looking 
at how we stack up to others around us. We're always comparing ourselves to others. If we think we exceed those around us in spiritual practices, we feel better about ourselves and pride manifests itself in a superiority complex. If we think we don't measure up to those around us, we feel worse about ourselves and pride manifests itself in an inferiority complex. Whether we eval- evaluate ourselves as superior or inferior, both are fruits of an ordinate self-concern, navel-gazing, obsessing over the self. Both are results of pride. The gospel is the great antidote to pride. Here's how Tim Keller puts it. He said, the gospel says that we are so bad that Jesus had to die for us. So bad Jesus had to die for us. This keeps us humble. This kills the superiority complex. Also, the gospel says that we are so loved that Jesus was willing to die for us. Though we are weak, we are wanted. That kills the inferiority complex that pride births. We have nothing to prove. We can embrace our weakness, which drives us away from ourselves to find help. And we can embrace God's love for us, which drives us to Him for that help. Though weak, we can go to God with humble confidence. None will be accepted and resourced by Him. So Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Whether you are accomplished or not, you are loved by God and that's all you need. Gospel love is fuel that powers gospel practices. In closing, we looked at the what of some spiritual practices, the why, and the how, the fuel. With this in mind, I have three quick applications. They're more like little bullet point invitations. First, next week for Sunday worship, Kenny will give a shorter sermon with more time for prayer and worship. As elders, we want to be praying more and we want to call the church, call you to be praying. And this is a good way to do it, having a a service with more worship and prayer next week. And I wonder if any of you would join me in fasting that morning for that worship service. It was a curiosity of what the Lord might do as we add that practice into our time together. Second, out of my, my own need and desire for guidance in God's presence and to kind of kickstart me into these, this practice for that. Mondays, the rest of the Mondays in September through October, I'm going to fast over lunch and pray. I wonder if any of you would take up that weekly fast and pray. Seek the Lord for processing through what we've been through. And looking forward to what he has for us individually and as a church as we move forward. Third, keep fueling up. Lean into your weakness and into God's love for you as gospel love is the fuel for these gospel practices. Let's pray. Father, you are our refuge and strength. You are our safety. You are our security. You are the one that we want to run to. You're the one that we desire most. And you've given us ways to do that. Grant that we would come to you. You are our safety and you are our ability. You are our strength. 
May we come to you, engage with you in these ways, that you would strengthen us. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to this message from Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Feel free to make copies of this message to give to others, but please do not charge for these copies or alter their content in any way without written permission from Bethlehem Baptist Church. For more information, we invite you to visit us online at Bethlehem.Church or write us at 720 13th Avenue South, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55415. Bethlehem Baptist Church, spreading a passion for the supremacy of God in all things, for the joy of all peoples, through Jesus Christ.